Chapter One of An Antarctic Mystery or The Finks of the Ice Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Antarctic Mystery by Jules Verne. Chapter One The Kerguelen Islands. No doubt the following narrative will be received with entire incredulity but i think it well that the public should be put in possession of the facts narrated in an antarctic mystery the public is free to believe them or not as its good pleasure no more appropriate scene for the wonderful and terrible adventures which i am about to relate could be imagined than the desolation islands so called in seventeen seventy nine by captain cook i lived there for several weeks and i can affirm on the evidence of my own eyes and my own experience that the famous explorer and navigator was happily inspired when he gave the islands that significant name geographical nomenclature however insists on the name of kerguelen which is generally adopted for the group which lies in forty nine degrees forty five minutes south latitude and sixty nine degrees six minutes east longitude this is just because in seventeen seventy two Baron Kerguelen, a Frenchman, was the first to discover those islands in the southern part of the Indian Ocean. Indeed, the commander of the squadron on that voyage believed he had found a new continent on the limit of the Antarctic seas. But in the course of a second expedition he recognized his error. There was only an archipelago. I may be believed when I assert that Desolation Islands is the only suitable name for this group of three hundred isles or islets in the midst of the vast expanse of ocean which is constantly disturbed by astral storms nevertheless the group is inhabited and the number of europeans and americans who formed the nucleus of the kerguelen population at the date of the second of august eighteen thirty nine had been augmented for two months past by a unit in my person just then I was waiting for an opportunity of leaving the place, having completed the geological and mineralogical studies which had brought me to the group in general, and to Christmas Harbour in particular. Christmas Harbour belongs to the most important islet of the archipelago, one that is about half as large as Corsica. It is safe and easy, and free of access. Your ship may ride securely at single anchor in its waters, while the bay remains free from ice. The Kerguelens possess hundreds of other fjords. Their coasts are notched and ragged, especially in the parts between the north and the southeast, where the little islets abound. The soil, of volcanic origin, is composed of quartz, mixed with a bluish stone. In summer it is covered with green mosses, grey lichens, various hardy plants, especially wild saxifrage. Only one edible plant grows there, a kind of cabbage, not found anywhere else, and very bitter of flavor. Great flocks of royal and other penguins people these islets, finding good lodging on their rocky and mossy surface. These stupid birds, in their yellow and white feathers, with their heads thrown back, and their wings like the sleeves of a monastic habit, look at a distance, like monks in single file, walking in procession along the beach. The islands afford refuge to numbers of sea-calves, seals, and sea-elephants. The taking of those amphibious animals, either on land or from the sea, is profitable, and may lead to a trade which will bring a large number of vessels into these waters. On the day already mentioned, I was accosted, while strolling on the port, by mine host of Mine Inn. Unless I am much mistaken, time is beginning to seem very long to you, Mr. Jorling. The speaker was a tall American, who kept the only inn on the port. "'If you will not be offended, Mr. Atkins, I will acknowledge that I do find it long.' "'Of course I won't be offended. Am I not well used to answers of that kind, as the rocks of the Cape to the rollers?' "'And you resist them equally well.' "'Of course, from the day of your arrival at Christmas Harbour, when you came to the Green Cormorant, I said to myself that in a fortnight, if not in a week, you would have enough of it, and would be sorry you had landed in the Kerguelens. No, indeed, Mr. Atkins, I never regret anything I have done. 
That's a good habit, sir. Besides, I have gained knowledge by observing curious things here. I have crossed the rolling plains, covered with hardy stringy mosses, and I shall take away curious mineralogical and geological specimens with me. I have gone sealing, and taken sea-calves with your people. I have visited the rookeries where the penguins and the albatross live together in good fellowship, and that was well worth my while. You have given me now and again a dish of petrol, seasoned by your own hand, and very acceptable, when one has a fine, healthy appetite. I have found a friendly welcome at the green cormorant, and I am very much obliged to you. But if I am right in my reckoning, it is two months since the Chilean two-master Penes set me down at Christmas Harbour in midwinter. And you want to get back to your own country, which is mine, Mr. Dorling, to return to Connecticut, to Providence, our capital. Doubtless, Mr. Atkins, for I have been a globetrotter for close upon three years. One must come to a stop and take root at some time. Yes, and when one has taken root, one puts out branches. Just so, Mr. Atkins. However, I have no relations living. It is likely that I shall be the last of my line. I am not likely to take a fancy for marrying at forty. Well, well, that is a matter of taste. Fifteen years ago I settled down comfortably at Christmas Harbour with my Betsy. She has presented me with ten children, who in their turn will present me with grandchildren. Will you not return to the old country? What should I do there, Mr. Jorlings, and what could I ever have done there? There was nothing before me but poverty. Here, on the contrary, in these islands of desolation, where I have no reason to feel desolate, ease and competence have come to me and mine. No doubt, and I congratulate you, Mr. Atkins, for you are a happy man. Nevertheless, it is not impossible that the fancy may take you some day. Mr. Atkins answered by a vigorous and convincing shake of the head. It was very pleasant to hear this worthy American talk. He was completely acclimatized on his archipelago and to the conditions of life there. He lived with his family as the penguins lived in their rookeries. His wife was a valiant woman of the scriptural type. His sons were strong, hardy fellows who did not know what sickness meant. His business was prosperous. The green cormorant had the custom of all the ships, whalers and others, that put in at Kerguelen. Atkins supplied them with everything they required, and no second inn existed at Christmas Harbour. His sons were carpenters, sailmakers, and fishers, and they hunted the amphibians in all the creeks during the hot season. In short, this was a family of honest folk, who fulfilled their destiny without much difficulty. Once more, Mr. Atkins, let me assure you, I resumed, I am delighted to have come to Kerguelen. I shall always remember the islands kindly. Nevertheless, I should not be sorry to find myself at sea again. Come, Mr. Jorlings, you must have a little patience, said the philosopher. You must not forget that the fine days will soon be here, in five or six weeks. Yes, and in the meantime the hills and the plains, the rocks and the shores will be covered thick with snow and the sun will not have strength to dispel the mists on the horizon. Now there you are again, Mr. Jorling. Why, the wild grass is already peeping through the white sheet. Just look. Yes, with a magnifying glass. Between ourselves, Atkins, could you venture to pretend that your bays are not still ice-locked in this month of August, which is the February of our northern hemisphere? I acknowledge that, Mr. Jorling, but again I say have patience. The winter has been mild this year. The ships will soon show up, in the east or in the west, for the fishing season is near. May heaven hear you, Atkins, and guide the Halbrane safely into port. Captain Len Guy? Ah, he's a good sailor, although he's English. They are good people everywhere, and he takes his supplies at the green cormorant. You think the Halbrane? You will be signaled before a week, Mr. Jorling or if not, it will be because there is no longer a Captain Len Guy. And if there is no longer a Captain Len Guy, it is because the Halbrane has sunk in full sail between the Kerguelens and the Cape of Good Hope. Thereupon Mr. Atkins walked away with a scornful gesture, indicating that such an eventuality was out of all probability. 
My intention was to take my passage on board the Halbrane so soon as she could come to her moorings in Christmas Harbour. After the rest of six or seven days, she would set sail again for Tristan d'Acuna, where she was to discharge her cargo of tin and copper. I meant to stay in the island for a few weeks of the fine season, and from thence set out for Connecticut. Nevertheless, I did not fail to take into due account the share that belongs to chance in human affairs, for it is wise, as Edgar Poe has said, always to reckon with the unforeseen, the unexpected, the inconceivable, which have a very large share in those affairs, and chance ought to always to be a matter of strict calculation. Each day I walked about the port and its neighbourhood. The sun was growing strong. The rocks were emerging by degrees from their winter clothing of snow. Moss of a wine-like colour was springing up on the basalt cliffs. Strips of seaweed fifty yards long were floating on the sea. And on the plain Lila, which is of Andean origin, was pushing its little points, and the only leguminous plant of the region, that gigantic cabbage already mentioned, valuable for its antiscorbutic properties, was making its appearance. I had not come across a single land mammal. Sea mammals swarm in these waters, not even of the batrachian or reptilian kinds. A few insects only, butterflies or others, and even these did not fly, for before they could use their wings, the atmospheric currents carried the tiny bodies away to the surface of the rolling waves. And the halbrane, I used to say to Atkins each morning, the halbrane, Mr. Jorling, he would reply with complacent assurance, will surely come into port to-day, or if not to-day, to-morrow. In my rambles on the shore, I frequently routed a crowd of amphibians, sending them plunging into the newly released waters. The penguins, heavy and impassive creatures, did not disappear at my approach. They took no notice. But the black petrels, the puffins, black and white, the grebes and others, spread their wings at the sight of me. One day I witnessed the departure of an albatross, saluted by the very best croaks of the penguins, no doubt as a friend whom they were to see no more. Those powerful birds can fly for two hundred leagues without resting for a moment, and with such rapidity that they sweep through vast spaces in a few hours. The departing albatross sat motionless upon a high rock, at the end of the bay of Christmas Harbour, looking at the waves as they dashed violently against the beach. Suddenly the bird rose with a great sweep into the air, its claws folded beneath it, its head stretched out like the prow of a ship, uttering its shrill cry. A few moments later it was reduced to a black speck in the vast height and disappeared behind the misty curtains of the south. End of chapter 1